Hi, good morning, everyone. We're going to get started, if that's okay. So today, our didactic is called The Hidden Costs of the Minority Tax in Academic Emergency Medicine, Challenges and Pathways Forward. We have many presenters and facilitators, most of us sitting right here or in the very front. And we have no disclosures as a group. The objectives of today's didactic is that first we'll define the concept of the minority tax within the context of academic emergency medicine. Next, we'll describe the implications of the minority tax on career development while being in departmental DEI efforts. And then lastly, we'll identify strategies that academic EM departments can employ to recognize and compensate for the minority tax experienced. Um, the general flow of this didactic will be for the first five to ten minutes. We'll set up uh, background definitions and then we'll get into breakout groups and then come out of those and talk about um, conversations, discussions had in these breakout groups and then um, at the very end summarize key points and takeaways. So what is the minority tax? It's the increased responsibilities that underrepresented in medicine and minoritized individuals face to participate in and lead to diversity efforts. So URIM being the um, old AAMC definition, mostly racial and ethnic minorities, so black or African American, Hispanic, Span um, Latino or of Spanish origin, um, Alaskan Native or American Indian, and then Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander. But then minoritized individuals being more inclusive to gender and sexual minorities as well as those um, with disabilities. And then the diversity efforts that we speak of are mostly recruitment of uh, URIM, um, faculty or trainees, mentorship, committee participation, um, so on and so forth. Sorry, I'm tucked away here. Um, on the right-hand side, you'll see, you'll see this uh, picture that is oftentimes referenced um, in conversations and research regarding minority tax. So on the left-hand um, side, you have non-URM faculty, and on the right-hand side, you have URM faculty. And you'll see that both have obligations of research, education, and service. Um, but on the right-hand side, so URM faculty um, oftentimes having more clinical um, obligations have to do work related to diversity efforts, uh, have experiences with racism and isolation, and then also mentorship and um, promotional disparities. And so I'll get into bits and pieces of all of this in the coming slides. There are five main subcategories of the minority tax. So first is the mentorship tax, gratitude tax, emotional tax, isolation tax, and then lastly, the clinical assignments tax. So the mentorship tax is the burden or cost that mentors themselves bear when providing guidance, support, and resources to their mentees. So oftentimes, one faculty will have many non and URM um, mentees and feel overstretched or overcommitted um, to the mentees. And then they themselves um, do not get sufficient or effective mentorship. So it arises from a shortage of effective mentors for the URM faculty themselves. Next is the gratitude tax. So this is the feeling of obligation that URM faculty have to their academic institution and to future generations of URMs. So feeling like they are just happy to be here um, cannot sometimes an imposter phenomena that goes along with that. Um, and as a result, oftentimes may seek or may avoid seeking new opportunities or advancements as they feel bound by a sense of loyalty or obligation to their current institution. Next, we have the emotional tax. So this is the emotional toll of defending or explaining one's underrepresented history, identity, and culture to non-underrepresented colleagues. And oftentimes, this kind of goes on as an extension of having to defend themselves against experiences of racism in the workplace and just experiences that happen to others. They feel like they have to be that person that um, is responsible for um, addressing it in some way. Fourth, we have the isolation tax. So feeling of isolation due to cultural isolation and also disconnect between institutional goals and actual activities. So for that latter point, the disconnect, um, your institution has stated missions, visions, and goals, um, but you see the activities that the department or institution is doing and you feel like they're maybe not well aligned or um, not as sufficient or maybe disingenuous. And so this disconnect is oftentimes exacerbated um, by these faculty, uh, by faculty not being involved in uh, these efforts. And then lastly, we have the clinical assignments tax. So this is URM faculty oftentimes having more clinical duties than their non-URM counterparts. And this comes at the expense, of course, of things like research and education, which are oftentimes in service, which are tied with uh, promotional um, opportunities. And hence, we have these promotional disparities that come up with this. 
So why is it important? So hopefully I've gotten into bits and pieces of it in explaining these five subcategories, but it's really an issue of both diversity and inclusion within medicine. So lack of diversity, meaning that the fewer you are on faculty that are in the workplace, a lot of this burden falls on the very few that exist. And then as a result, they oftentimes face these experiences of isolation and discrimination. And so this lack of inclusivity in the workplace goes in hand in hand with this. Um, there have been few studies that have looked at the minority tax. Uh, one study that's looked at it at the medical student level and then a few qualitative and narrative um, pieces um, that have looked at it at the faculty level. And at the medical student level, it's been found to be associated with burnout. And then at the faculty level, it's been to be associated with uh, disparities in mentorship and promotion, as well as experiences of discrimination and social isolation. So I know I just went through what the minority tax is and kind of the five subcategories. Very, very brief overview, but we were gonna break out into groups for the next 15 minutes, and then 15 minutes after that, we'll come together and discuss. Um, breakout groups are essentially these case studies that talk about the subcategories and um, what we would do in certain scenarios. Um, if, based on the room here, having people break out into groups of four, five, maybe closest to you, and we'll have and we'll have facilitators for every single group hello everyone hi <laughs> Thank you for participating in those discussions. Um, at least in the group that I was in, we had some really great discussions. So thank you all for your perspectives. Um, we're just going to go through, I think we had four breakout groups. So um, I'll read out some of the uh, case studies so you guys can see what some of the other groups were talking about. And if anyone from those groups wants to share some of the kind of key takeaways or interesting questions that they pose, that would be great. Um, OK, so case study number one, um, Dr. O. So Dr. O, originally from Ghana, is often expected to lead community outreach programs targeting African immigrants. While he's passionate about community service, the constant expectation to represent and serve every African community is overwhelming and detracts from his academic work. Were there, I don't know which group this was, but if anyone wants to raise a hand or um, volunteer something that they found interesting in their discussions. Which group was this? OK. I think one of the things that came up that was interesting was what happens to the, the one person, um, what pressure does it put on them to be the one person running something? I thought that was a really interesting part, because it puts, puts pressure on them to not be to a community and with no one serving them. And, mm -hmm. and all Yeah. Sort of the, the concept of duty, right? So, like, part of why they might have gravitated towards that work initially was this, like, this sense of duty to that group. Um, and then, unfortunately, then, like, how do they ever back off from that or leave that if they have to? Um, mm -hmm. there's, there's that hole to consistently be there. Yeah. Yeah, and I think we have a kind of a variety of people that are in leadership positions versus earlier on in their career. So, I think there's some interesting kind of perspectives on how we can support people versus how people are looking for support here. So um, is there anything else? I'll just kind of, yeah, we can move on. <laughs> um, uh, this case study number two has to deal with Dr. K and his daily struggles with microaggressions. So Dr. K is an emergency physician of Middle Eastern descent who frequently encounters microaggressions at work. Colleagues comment on his exotic accent or express surprise at his fluency in English. While these comments might seem harmless um, or even complimentary to some, uh, they serve as a constant reminder that he's perceived as an outsider and over time have made him feel isolated and less connected to his department, although he's been part of it for a long time. Additionally, patients sometimes ask where he's from and rarely will, make, will ask to see a doctor of a different race or make racist comments towards or about him. Does anyone kind of want to talk about, I think we had some interesting discussions about like mentorship, um, looking at uh, kind of systemic approaches to how um, we, can, we can kind of address um, creating safe spaces for people to report microaggressions um, and the kind of need for that feeling of psychological safety so that people can really escalate these concerns. Um, 
if anyone from that group kind of wants to volunteer any perspective. Yeah, absolutely. And another thing that was brought up during this discussion that I thought was really valuable is, especially for um, individuals that are maybe at institutions with less institutional support, um, creating a network across institutions can be really useful to start, um, start some of those efforts and just make those connections for the future and things like that. Um, yeah. yeah. Subliminally, that tells your your group that's a little dysfunctional that you know there there are other opportunities. <laughs> Very subtle, but they didn't pick up on that. Yeah. Uh, and we also talk about trans. Good morning, Cheryl. And we talk about transparency um, and ensuring that whatever data you have, we do this of uh, where people sit in their uh, engagement surveys and, their, and, and and put it out there. Not to shame people, but to celebrate the ones who are doing it and the ones who are at the bottom. I'll give you that face. It's really another opportunity to uh, help people to believe they could do that. Yeah. All right. We can move on to the next one. Um, and then case study number three. So Dr. R. Um, Dr. R is a talented black emergency medicine resident. Since joining, she has been frequently approached by the program's leadership to participate in diversity panels, recruitment events targeting underrepresented students, and to be featured in promotional materials, um, highlighting the program's commitment to diversity. While Dr. R is passionate about promoting diversity in medicine, she feels an overwhelming pressure to always be the face of diversity for her program. This added responsibility on top of her demanding residency schedule has left her feeling overextended and tokenized. So if anyone from this group wants to, or, or not from this group, wants to talk about what y'all discussed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it was you that mentioned the like kind of starting a lot of these trainings and a lot of stuff early on in the pipeline in our in our group. So yeah, definitely. I think that this is also highlighting another reason why it's important for these residents to have support early on, 
Because oftentimes voicing these kinds of concerns and issues can also lead to real blowbacks on your own career and kind of how you're perceived in an organization. Mm -hmm. And having a champion who's by your side there and advocating for you can help soften that and help you navigate this in a way that is not detrimental to your career your life here immediately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So again, kind of that like psychological safety and knowing that you're not gonna receive retribution for reporting things like microaggressions or anything else that happens in the department. Absolutely. And then I think we had one more case study. Okay, um, so Dr. T, um, oh, not this one. It was this one, okay. Um, Dr. T. Dr. T is a black associate professor in emergency medicine and one of few URIM faculty members in her department. She's an expert in her field and is often invited to speak at conferences on topics related to diversity and inclusion. While Dr. T appreciates the recognition, she feels pigeonholed into only discussing diversity topics. She also feels isolated in her department with few colleagues who share or understand her experiences, which has led to feelings of frustration and a desire to seek opportunities elsewhere. So we kind of had some of these conversations even in our group, so I'm curious to see if anyone wants to report back anything from that group. I can start. Sure, that'd be great. So we talked about like when the isolation struggle, sometimes people are not aware that it's an issue and like they might think it's in their head, but um, actually like voicing their concern and being audible and telling other people what they're experiencing can open up doors like for help and for our other colleagues to step in so that they're not so isolated. And we talked about how like some people are not even aware that the minority tax is a thing, but there's a word for it, and having a word for it like helps um, like express that isolation. And, and so it makes it more like, I guess, tangible when you approach like your department for assistance. Um, and did you guys want to add anything? I don't think we have to, but I think the naming it is important, but it also, it, it's sort of like crucial to not let naming it allow it to be normalized, right? So um, just because it has a, uh, a, a given like term doesn't mean it's normal and it's okay. Like it's mm -hmm. okay, this is being experienced. You're not in isolation um, experiencing this, but it's not that it meant normalized. Yeah. I think something that came up in our group was also the importance of having a national network or developing a network for yourself. The leadership that was in our group shared that they had mentored various people who had been in departments that were um, less diverse or have, you know, basically no mentorship available for, um, you know, people who were minoritized or had different abilities. And um, coming to SAEM and establishing mentors within ADIE at more groups um, has been really helpful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you all for sharing. I think that was all of the case studies. Oh, there was one more. Okay. This, the, okay. Dr. P, um, a Pacific Islander emergency medicine physician, was the first in his family to attend med school. Um, he's incredibly grateful for his position at a prestigious academic institution, but feels an immense pressure to represent his community and often takes on extra shifts ser serving underserved populations. Despite feeling overwhelmed, Dr. P hesitates to decline these additional responsibilities and is also hesitant to seek opportunities outside his current institution, feeling a deep sense of loyalty. However, this has led to burnout and a feeling of stagnation in his career. So, if anyone wants to report back from their group. I don't know which group this was. So we've talked a lot about, uh, one of the major concepts here was basically having individual faculty goals, I, I think, you know, and, and being able to express those goals and delay those goals and seek, and be able to uh, create kind of a faculty, your own faculty development plan if you don't have one in your department, right? So you have to have another pathway, you gotta know where you're going, basically, so you, you have to set your own priorities and you have to learn to say no a lot of these, these concepts because if it doesn't fit into your long-term goal, then it's something you might want to feel dial back on or cut back on, you know, all these things. So, so, uh, we also talked a lot about uh, the concepts of mentorship and, you know, uh, being able to uh, find mentors um, inside and outside the department to, uh, you know, to have check-ins and to be, you know, to make sure that, uh, that you are, you know, basically fitting into people are getting in, you know, you know adjusting to be coming and attending. And it's a big, big transition between resident and attending, you know, you say. So 
<coughs> just having those groups or creating those groups uh, so that people can feel better adjusted in, in that transition. Yeah, and just to add to that, uh, they mentioned kind of like two parts to this uh, gratitude uh, tax where you feel grateful, but there's also that part where there's the fear of if I speak up or if I make my concerns known, you know, will there be repercussions? So kind of forming like a support group. We sort of discuss a pause or sort of like a diverse mentorship model, people that are closer to your stage, but also having different kind of mentors that are structured in, um, not only for early career, mid-career, just different stages. And the owner shouldn't only be on the individual, mm -hmm. but the department itself should have something that's structured. department, even beyond the field of emergency medicine, because there might be people doing things that um, are nuanced to emergency medicine, but um, in other fields are better developed and you can find mentorship outside of that. Yeah, I really like what you were saying about kind of uh, shifting the onus back to the institution and to leadership. That's definitely really important. Um, Ideally, we'd like basically programs where, you know, obviously you have to have like an annual evaluation with, with, you know, with the department of chairs and all that, but aside from that, Having you know definitely defined faculty development meetings actually for each faculty member, you know, so that they can express their goals in a in a, in a basically non-evaluation type method, you know, mm -hmm. where it's like, hey, this is more about not how you fit the department, it's just about more about you, your goals in particular, as opposed. So it's a different different mindset, different type of meeting. Focus on the faculty member as opposed to focus kind of on the overall department. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you all for sharing um, and reporting back all of those things. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Ordonez, who has a few slides just to wrap us up. All right. So I'm just going to wrap up with some uh, take-home points. You know, unfortunately, we went a little bit over, um, which is fine because I think that you know it was important to have some robust discussion when we're you know discussing this topic, and I think that's obviously more important. And you know, the good thing is that in actual actuality, the slides that that I was going to present kind of summarize a lot of the things that we have discussed in terms of how do we address the minority tax, how do we mitigate it. Um, we've talked about transparency, we've talked about recognizing diversity efforts, and there's various ways to do that, whether that's through acknowledgments, that's communications, through your departmental emails, um, you know, and amplifying people's work. Um, but it's also important, obviously, to have some allocated protected time for DEI activities, which I think that many organizations are, you know, stepping into that realm. But, uh, you know, it needs to definitely become a reality. And obviously, the equity in clinical assignments piece is important. Um, you know, always looking to just make sure that, you know, clinical assignments are distributed equitably and fairly. Um, allyship is obviously important. We need allies, uh, minoritized colleagues need allies to help foster this culture of inclusion and create an environment where people feel safe um, make sure that you're recognizing folks, amplifying their voices, as I mentioned, um, educating yourselves, challenging biases, any overt discrimination that you witness. Um, we talked a little bit about upstander interventions and how important that is uh, in terms of intervening when you see these types of uh, these events occur. And then actively supporting uh, and participating in DEI initiatives, not necessarily having to lead them, uh, but, you know, if you are able to attend events or participate or contribute in some manner, that's always helpful. And so I think, you know, going forward, we talked about, you know, continuous education. We were in a field where it's about lifelong learning. And I think DEI has to be integrated into that uh, lifelong learning for us, whether, again, those are workshops in our didactics, whether that's development programs. And then we've got to look at our policies, right? So when you come up with your departmental strategic plan, use an, a lens of equity, um, develop a strategic plan that makes sure that you have clear, equitable, and transparent policies in your department. We talked about mentorship also, right? And how important mentorship and sponsorship is, especially for minoritized colleagues who may not have um, adequate uh, mentors in their respective spaces. And like everything else, we got to monitor, we got to evaluate and adjust, you know, as needed to, to, to make better change. So 
this is kind of like a last call to action, and I want to make sure just to finish off with this point, that it's important for us to just realize that the minority tax exists, right? And we have to commit collectively to address and mitigate the minority tax with you know, the various ways that we discussed today in our discussions and in the summary that we're presenting to you. Um, and we need to advocate, be advocates for inclusion and specifically at a time like right now when there's a lot of you know, anti-DEI sentiment, um, you know, it's again with collective effort that we're gonna be able to make transformative change in this, in this work. So thank you all again for participating. I wanna make sure that everybody's able to get to the plenary session which is about to start. Here's just some references that we use for the talk. And we have a QR code if uh, people wanna look at. We put together a little infographic on best practices in mitigating the minority tax. So we'll be outside if you have any questions for me. Thanks. Sure, sorry.